Nicholas Sula, and Nico Schlatterbeck. Two top of the headline signings for Dortmund, both at a make it or break it time of their careers. Zula is a gentle giant who's insanely nimble and quick. And Schlatterbeck, despite his deceptive boyish looks, is an uncompromising hard man. Depending on how their forthcoming spells at Dortmund go, they will prove to be the backline fortifications BVB so desperately need. And if they fail, Zula will confirm his naysayers' assertions that he's no longer first-team quality. And Schlotterbeck? He'll disprove the hype and become a falling star rather than a shooting one. Nevertheless, Nicholas Zula and Nico Schlotterbeck will undoubtedly make an impact at BVB. Hi everyone, welcome to the Footy Girl channel where this girl talks everything football or soccer. Today's topic is the acquisition of Niklas Sula and Nico Schlotterbeck by Borussia Dortmund earlier this year. I'll be breaking down each player's past, how they fared during the 2021-2022 season, how they compare with each other, and how they'll link up within Dortmund's current defensive lineup. But before we get into all of that, make sure you hit the subscribe button and click the bell if you'd like to see more in-depth football analysis. Now this is gonna be a pretty meaty video, so I advise you get a snack, maybe a beverage, and make use of the chapters in the description as well as the timeline bar below. All good? Did you subscribe? Are you sure you subscribed? Okay, all right, let's get started then. I'll start off with Nicholas Zula. The right-footed Zula, or Nicky, as he's nicknamed like myself, was signed by Dortmund on February 7th of this year. The 26-year-old, who hails from Frankfurt, comes from somewhat of a footballing family, like many of these guys do. His older brother Fabian was also an aspiring footballer who even got a scholarship to study at St. Francis College in New York City, but decided to focus on academics after turning down an offer from Mines under 19. Although Fabian, or Fabi, decided against becoming a pro footballer, he's been in close quarters with younger brother Nicky as he coaches at Sportfreunde München, whose stadium is on the same road as the Allianz Arena. According to Fabian, Nicholas's top speed is one of his strengths, and his outstanding qualities as a footballer were apparent back when they were children, playing in the back garden where their father created a makeshift goal and wetted the grass just for them. Fabi seems to be one of Nikki's biggest fans and loves how whether it's Nicholas training in the morning or him coaching in the evening after work, there's always a Zula on Zebnestrasse. Despite Zula being the brother that ended up pursuing football professionally in an alternative universe, we might have seen Zula actually become a professional golfer. Apparently, he plays a lot of golf with Thomas Muller and whoever loses has to buy lunch. Although he loves golfing, I'm sure we can all agree that Zula's presence is more appreciated on the pitch than on the green. At 6'5 and 218 pounds, or 195 centimeters and 99 kilos, Zula's physical presence on the pitch is undisputed. Now, sometimes I feel like people talk about Nicholas Zula like he's like, obese or something right the guy is 6'5 he's gonna be big he's not you know he's not a boy anymore he's not in his teens or early 20s so it makes sense that he's gained a few pounds over the years at Bayern if he looked for example like Sasha Moldas then I would start to be concerned by the way, let me know below if you'd like to see a video on the enigma that is former Munich 1860 striker Sasha Moldes. He's an interesting guy. As a youth player at Rottweiss Waldorf, Eintracht Frankfurt, and Darmstadt, Zula was actually an attacker. But when he moved to Hoffenheim, he became a defender. As he was bigger than the other kids, he was ultimately promoted to the men's team faster there and became their youngest ever debutante during the 2012-2013 season. At just 17 years old at the time, Zula built a lot of confidence as a defender during the 2012-2013 season as he helped Hoffenheim secure a place in the relegation playoff against Kaiserslautern. 
As stated on Bundesliga.com, Sula was a bit nervous during the last game of the season against Dortmund, but then he won a header against Robert Lewandowski and took the ball off Marco Royce. And that settled his nerves. They ended up beating Lautern during both legs of the relegation battle, and Hoffenheim have stayed up ever since. Zula ultimately spent five seasons at Hoffenheim, where he achieved 33 appearances during the 2015-2016 and 2016-2017 seasons. Also, during his time at Hoffenheim, he achieved his first German national team cap on August 31st, 2016, at the age of 20. Kind of a funny story, but Turkey actually tried to recruit Zula to their national team because they thought his last name sounded Turkish. I mean, I don't know Turkish or German, so I'm not sure about the validity of confusing Zula for a Turkish name. But we all know Turkey does a great job of conjoling Turkish Germans to play for their national team. But that's a story for another video, and if you'd like to hear about it, leave a comment below. Interestingly enough, however, Zula was eligible to play for Hungary as the paternal side of his family is from the country. But Zula did not pull a Willy Orban and decided to play for Germany. Anyway, after the end of the 2016-2017 season, Zula ultimately outgrew Hoffenheim and decided to move on to Bayern Munich. At Bayern Munich, Zula cultivated his great composure as a clean, solid defender who promotes quick transitions and good ball distribution. However, some would say that Zula's Bayern Munich phase represents a bit of a decline in his career. On the positive side, like most Bayern Munich players who have been present on the roster during the past decade, Zula has been able to lift a plethora of trophies with the team. He has won five Bundesliga championships, two DFB Pokals, four German Super Cups, and the 2019-2020 season Champions League. Additionally, he has lifted the Confederations Cup, FIFA Club World Cup, and UEFA Super Cup one time each with Bayern Munich. But domestically, Zula has never been able to match the 33 appearances that he reached at Hoffenheim. Needless to say, Zula and the concept of match fitness haven't always been the best of friends. He suffered a devastating ACL tear during the 2019-2020 season. The injury, which he first got at the age of 19 during his Hoffenheim days, had him out of commission for 182 days. From October 21st, 2019 to April 20th, 2020, he missed a total of 25 games that season, and people think he has not been fit since then. In fact, he had 10 significant injury spells during his five seasons at Bayern. By significant, I mean he missed more than 10 days at a time. And during three of those 10 injury spells, he missed five or more games. On a positive note, Zula won the Bundesliga with Bayern Munich, but overall the 2021-2022 season was shaky for him. Muscle issues, COVID, and influenza had him miss six Bundesliga games. Out of 28 appearances, he didn't start 10 games and was subbed in nine games. Of course, one of the most noteworthy events of Zula's 2021-2022 season was his signing for Dortmund for four years on a free transfer. Zula also had Chelsea knocking on his door, but chose Dortmund instead. Zula told Bild shortly after his signing for Dortmund, from the first time they made contact, I immediately felt that the club leadership really wanted to work with me. But his farewell from Bayern was a bit strange. Interestingly, he was left out of the squad during the last game of the 2021-2022 season against Wolfsburg, despite being fit. Kind of a weird send-off from Nagelsmann, if I do say myself. But according to Nagelsmann, Zula decided to stay home in Munich. Guess what? You guys are extremely lucky because I've got an exclusive interview reel from Zula himself talking about this situation. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? But seriously. Translation? Nagelsmann is a bold-faced liar, and he left Nikki out of the squad. 
Sounds like a he said, he said situation if you ask me, but the two have had a long coach and player relationship which began years ago at Hoffenheim. As Nagelsmann told Bundesliga.com recently, I know he has unbelievable qualities and a lot of potential, which we try to bring out every day. He's played at the very top level in Europe and is developing fantastically, but there are still steps forward he can make. No matter how you dice it though, Bayern fans weren't too pleased with Zula being MIA during match day 34. The act might signal Zula is more than ready for some footy in front of the Gelbavand. Whether he was pushed out or showed himself the door, Zula seems keen to join his new club and fellow center back signing, Nico Schlotterbeck, who has already made the media rounds at Dortmund. So that was Zula's history and past season in a nutshell. But how about Schlotterbeck, Dortmund's May 2nd signing? 22 year old Nico Schlotterbeck was born in Weiblingen, a scenic town close to Stuttgart. Nicknamed Schlotty, like Zula, Football was a mainstay in Nico's childhood. The power player who has grown to be 6'3", 190 pounds, or 191 centimeters and 85 kilos, had some pretty high quality training as a footballer from his uncle Niels. Niels Schlotterbeck had a 16 year career as a professional footballer, including a season at Freiburg like his nephew. He made it to the DFB Pokal final with Stuttgart to kickers in 1987. After ending his football career, Niels became a youth coach and helped lay the foundation for his nephew's growing skills as a footballer. Make that nephews, plural, as Niels' brother Mark had two sons, Nico and Kevin. Nico the younger and Kevin the older by two years. Niels helped train the left-footed brothers and the two ultimately became center backs, although Nico began as a midfielder. Similar to the Zula brothers, the Schlotterbeck brothers' first pitch was their back garden. However, unleke the Zula brothers, both Schlotterbecks became professional footballers. Nico told Bundesliga.com, As small children, we often played in the garden and had the aim of becoming professional footballers, like a lot of little kids at that age. Very few people make it into professional football, and the fact that we both made it was something incredible. It goes without saying that the Schlotterbeck brothers are close and have had each other's support throughout their careers. They both started at Stuttgart Kickers where their uncle Niels is well known. However, they joined different youth teams for a time. Over the years, Nico built strong skills in heading ability, long passing, and scoring from set pieces. After leaving Stuttgart Kickers, he continued to cultivate his skills at Allen and Karlsruhe. Eventually, Nico reunited with his brother Kevin at Freiburg where he switched from a middle fielder to a center back. He joined the Freiburg under-19s and won the Bundesliga under-19 championship with them, before debuting at 19 years old with the senior team. Not only were the Schlotterbeck brothers now in very close quarters, but they also had similar loan experiences at Freiburg. During the 2019-2020 season, the season that Nico debuted on the senior team at Freiburg, Kevin was actually at Union Berlin on a loan. During the 2020-2021 season, the Schlotterbeck brothers switched with Kevin returning to Freiburg and Nico going off to Union Berlin for a one-year loan. Nico's loan spell was a bit rough as he was somewhat injury prone during the 2020-2021 season. He spent 99 days out and missed 13 games due to a hamstring injury then a torn muscle fiber. Even so, he performed quite well at Union Berlin and helped them secure an impressive 7th place. He was also crowned European Under-21 Champion of 2021 with the German national team. Upon his return to Freiburg, he became an undisputed first-team starter on the back line and an up-and-coming star in the Bundesliga. But unfortunately for older brother Kevin Schlotterbeck, this created competition between the two as they were both center backs, and Nico ended up winning that competition. On the topic of competing with his older brother for a place in the starting 11, Nico says, Obviously, it's a bit weird. We would prefer to be on the pitch together, but this is the situation we're in now. We're going about it normally, though. Recently, we've been playing with a back three. 
in which case we're not treading on each other's toes anyway. I'm expecting Kevin to soon be used more regularly. Nico Schlotterbeck's 2021-2022 season was hella successful. He debuted with the German senior national team on March 26, 2022 and earned his first two German caps during the season. Domestically, he earned his biggest career win, 0-6 away at Gladbach. He only missed two games due to COVID and started in all the games he played during the 2021-2022 season, bringing his total appearances for Freiburg to 48. Nico said in a Sport 1 interview, from a sporting point of view, it was the best year I've had so far. I celebrated a title at international level for the first time with the under-21s, I reached the conference league with Union Berlin, and now I finally have my regular place at Freiburg, which I've been striving for for two or three years, and thanks to my performances, I was also called up to the senior national team, which was a huge dream. Unfortunately, like his uncle Niels did with Stuttgart to kickers when they played against Hamburger SV, Nico and Kevin lost the DFP Pokal final with Freiburg against RB Leipzig, but both showed an amazing effort. Naturally, Nico will be hoping to continue the positive trend at Dortmund, who he signed a five year contract for. Quite a sweet deal for both parties as Dortmund signed the youngster for 25 million euros despite his 30 million market value and Nico Schlotterbeck receiving 20 million upfront with 5 million promised in future fees. Of course, Bayern Munich and Newcastle were also salivating for the chance to sign Nico Schlotterbeck. However, as Nico told Kicker, I'm not someone who really aspires to play in England or Spain. I have always wanted to play in the Bundesliga, preferably with the best team. Now, some may argue that the Rekordmeister are actually the best team in the Bundesliga rather than Dortmund. However, with top signings like Uz Chen and Nico Schlotterbeck's good friend Adeyemi, the tides may change during the 2022-2023 season. Now that we've covered Zula and Schlotterbeck's histories and past seasons, let's compare how they are as defensive players. I tried to use criterion that are reasonable when evaluating a defensive player's skills. Discipline. How many fouls did they draw and cards did they get? Defense. How many duels and tackles did they win? Offense. How many attempts did they make on goal? How many goals did they score? And how many assists did they give? Durability. How injury prone are they? Accuracy. How good is their pass completion? And finally, speed. Obviously, how fast are they? So, let's take a look at how these two compare head to head. Last season, Zula received 10 fouls and got two yellow cards, while Schlotterbeck got triple the number of fouls, over triple, at 32, and received a total of five yellow cards. So, while both players are quite physical, it's obvious that Schlotterbeck is a little less clean than Zula. Winner, Zula. During the 2021-2022 season, Zula won 163 tackles and 53 aerial duels, while on the other hand, Schlotterbeck won an impressive 394 tackles and 128 aerial duels. Winner, Schlotterbeck. While both defenders have a penchant for taking shots on goal when they have the chance, the statistics here are quite interesting. Last season, Zula scored one goal, provided two assists, and took 16 shots on goal, while Schlotterbeck pretty much doubled that statistic at four goals, one assist, and 38 shots on goal. As Schlotterbeck said, I want to be calm and confident and perform. I've started scoring goals now, which I think is good as a center back. I always want to keep a clean sheet. That's what matters most to me. When a clean sheet comes up, you win 99% of your games at the DFB because you have an enormous quality up front on the offensive. Let's take a moment to compare Schlotterbeck's offensive efforts with some of the top attacking midfielders in the Bundesliga. During the 2021-2022 season, 
Florian Kine scored four goals, had four assists, and took 39 shots on goal. Dominique Sabaslai scored six goals, had eight assists, and took 42 shots on goal. Marco Royce converted nine goals, had 12 assists, and took 50 shots on goal. And finally, Serge Gnabry scored 14 times, assisted five times, and took 68 shots on goal. As you can see, Schlotterbeck is quite the unique defender in that he can attack just as well as he defends. Winner, Schlotterbeck. Like I said earlier in this video, Zula's time at Bayern Munich has been plagued with many injury spells. And in some ways, his past season wasn't too different. Zula spent 52 days out and missed a total of eight games, whereas Schlotterbeck only missed 20 days and two games. Winner, Schlotterbeck. This one's pretty straightforward. Last season, Zula completed a total of 92.5% of his passes, while Schlotterbeck only completed 84%. Winner, Zula. This one's actually pretty interesting. Considering Zula's size, some folks may assume that he's pretty slow, but the guy can move. He's relatively fast. Last season, his average speed was 33.66 kilometers an hour, compared to Schlotterbeck's 33.59 kilometers an hour. Now, Schlotterbeck was slightly slower. However, he had more intensive runs and sprints, so, Considering that and the speed, I think this one is even Stevens. Ty. Overall winner, Schlotterbeck. Zula is the cleaner player, yet Schlotterbeck is slightly more well-rounded. Okay, so now we see where each player stands as they prepare to move to Dortmund and start working on July 1st. But how will they fit in with the rest of the squad and the defensive lineup already employed at Dortmund? While careful consideration must be taken to get the most value out of each player, considering how Dortmund only had seven clean sheets out of 34 Bundesliga games last season, Zula and Schlotterbeck are much needed additions to the back line. Let's evaluate which positions Zula and Schlotterbeck are most likely to play in by looking at four formations, two with a back four and two with a back three. A lineup with a back four might be the safest for Dortmund after several seasons with a leaky defense problem. In these formations, it would make the most sense to play Schlotterbeck as a center back and have him combine with Guerrero on the left. The empty slots indicated here by the red question marks could either be a Kanji if Mariah takes the right, or Hummels if Schlotterbeck gets the start over Guerrero. Zula is more likely to pair with a Kanji over Hummels, I think, considering the latter's lack of form in the recent season. However, Hummels can be vocal and an inspiring force on the pitch, particularly for younger players. Also, he's incredible at scoring from set pieces. A 4-5-1 would lock down the defense while channeling the ball forward quickly during attack. It would be interesting to see what Mirai can do now that he's fit after his long knee injury spell. He's still young and has a lot to learn, but he has shown a lot of potential. Zula and Schlotterbeck could possibly combine as center backs in a back four formation. However, they've never linked up in that manner for the national team yet, so I'd be curious to see how that actually plays out in reality. Frankly, I feel that Guerrero doesn't play best in a back four formation, so I would expect him to drop forward a little bit. I wouldn't play Chan in the back here. He's stronger as a defensive midfielder who links up in the front during attacks. Paslak, another young player, generally also needs to step up his game, but I feel like he could be a starter if there's a need or a good backup. In this formation, the attack has some fluidity here as Malin could step into the Royce Reina position. Overall, this is a very lockdown formation. I prefer more fluidity, but this could work against offensively strong teams where attacking on the rebound is more likely. 
In a 4-2-3, Dortmund could keep the defense tight while distributing the ball from the back and promoting quick transitions. Historically, this has been a very successful Rosa formation at BVB. He only lost once against Bayern in the first half of the 2021-2022 season with this plan. This formation allows the attacking midfielders freedom to press while defensive midfielders can channel the ball forward and join the attack when needed. When lined up this way, players can cover a lot of ground and it also allows for ample passing choices with nice triangles. Chan and Dahoud work better in build-up rather than actual attacking plays, so this formation allows them to play to their strengths. Also, Bellingham or Hazard would be positioned in a more attacking position, which I personally like. Of course, Malin can fall back in this formation as well. My back three permutations would allow Dortmund to activate the midfield and play a high pressing game. Of course, a back three would result in a slightly more exposed defense, which might be a risk for BVB, but it could create goose bump inducing attacks with the current personnel, particularly since Dortmund has always had a great passing game. If Teresic prefers a back three with both Zula and Schlotterbeck on the pitch, it's likely that Schlotterbeck would move to the left as a left wing back and Zula would be the sole center back. My hot take is that Guerrero is better on the wing. So these formations with a back three allow Guerrero to work to his strengths. This also allows Schlotterbeck to defend and join the attack on the flank when the opportunity arises. The 3-4-2-1 formation was also a historically successful lineup under Rosa. Now, in order for this formation to work, the midfield must have good stamina. Luckily, most Dortmund midfielders have great work rates. However, Brandt and Reyna are both kind of outliers in that sense. But in this formation, I would expect them to stay high anyway. With this plan, Schlotterbeck could be the ball dispossessor and Zula and Chan can distribute. The 3-4-2-1 is also great in that the defense can mark the offense one-to-one -one depending on what formation the opponents are playing. Like the 4-2-3-1, the 3-4-2-1 allows for great passing play. And there's a lot of fluidity with this formation. The team is free to fall back into an, for example, 4-3-3 if there's a need to tighten the defense. Wolf or Paslak would fall back, giving Guerrero the freedom to stay high. All the midfielders here are great box-to-box -box players. They've just never had the confidence in the front to finish attacking plays well. But with Adeyemi now, and Makoko improving more and more each day, that should all change. Finally, we've got the 3-5-2 formation. This allows the team to have a strong attack when pushing forward, and to shore up the defense on the flank when needed. Guerrero is highly competent in this defensive, offensive, deputizing style of play, and Wolf has stepped up to the plate on the right wing before, surprisingly. On the flip side though, currently this formation would be a bit of risk taking, especially if playing Paslak, Brandt, or Reyna. Overall, I'd say this is probably the riskiest formation to deploy from a defensive standpoint. However, if the team can build their confidence, this may be a useful one. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt. Editing Nikki here. Zula and Schlotterbeck combined against Hungary for the national team in a 3-4-2-1 formation on June 11th. So just wanted to update this a little bit. When I saw that game, I have to say it was pretty depressing to watch Schlotterbeck and honestly the defense as a whole, but particularly him. He could not complete several critical passes and relied a lot on Zula and the defensive midfield. Generally, I think Schlotterbeck lacked a bit of confidence and as a result ended up making a lot of brash decisions during the game. Yet this could be because he was a bit nervous on a big stage, but either way, Zignal Iduna is the biggest stage in the Bundesliga, so I hope he gets it together before the next season. A back four or a back three, which do I prefer? Personally, I think a back 
three would work great for Dortmund with their current personnel, particularly a 3-4-2-1, because this allows the team to shore up the defense, but also promotes attacking play. What do you guys think? Do you have any other ideas for formations or ways that Teresic can employ Schlotterbeck or Azula? Let me know below in the comments. In conclusion, Dortmund opened up the summer transfer season with two killer signings in Zula and Schlotterbeck. Both of these guys had many promising offers but decided to stay in Germany and choose Dortmund. This is a huge endorsement from two players at very critical times in their career. The move to Dortmund benefits Zula greatly as he frankly, would have likely faded away in regards to his development at Bayern at this juncture in his career. But to be honest, I see his addition to the team going one of two ways. Either Dortmund will be successful in creating an environment for him to improve, or given that Dortmund has done a horrible job of retaining defensive talent, they may fail to bring out Zula's potential. Then he would likely end up like a second Hummels if efforts aren't taken to prevent him from stagnating. Generally, Zula needs the right training style and support to bring out the best in him. Zula more than proved himself a good player at Hoffenheim and Bayern, but there are questions about his value add for Dortmund. Well, I think it, him going to Dortmund will just add another body. Just add another body. I don't necessarily think he's going to go into Dortmund and make them stronger and get them anywhere near Bayern and take them to a title. I don't think that's going to happen. Look, Zula has slipped in form over the past couple seasons, but he's more than proven that he's a competent footballer. Most importantly, he keeps goals out. According to Bundesliga.com, Bayern concede a goal once every 102 minutes on average when Zula is playing. They let in one every 70 minutes when he's not. All that being said, I really hope that Zula avoids injury at Dortmund and he's able to play consistently. Given his past with injuries, another major injury, another ACL tear may have him at least on the bench or at worst out for a very long time, if not permanently. As for Schlotterbeck, He's a solid center back who had many, many choices in terms of making a big move after his success at Freiburg. Dortmund will have to ensure that Nico's time at Dortmund doesn't become the defender version of Holland's. Scenario plays out that bright player signs for Dortmund, Dortmund doesn't live up to the player's expectations, and then they eventually leave. This could happen with Schlotterbeck if Dortmund don't promote or sign defensive talent at Nico's level. Honestly, I think Schlotterbeck has the potential to be one of the best center backs of this generation. But like I've said before, this is a highly pivotal time of his career. And he's chosen Dortmund essentially to be responsible for his future development. So if he doesn't shine, if he doesn't, you know, live up to those expectations this season, this may be the beginning of a decline, but I'm hoping that, you know, with the new management at Dortmund, that things will go well for Schlotterbeck and he will grow to be an incredible defensive player. On that note, as far as the management goes at Dortmund, there have been a lot of changes. Many Dortmund fans will say that they are positive changes with Sebastian Kehl coming in and replacing Zork and obviously Teresic taking Rosa's position. Basically, these two need to be ready to flip the script for Dortmund and make the team shine in the next season. Hopefully, Dortmund will not fail these talented players and if all goes well, both will be ready to perform at their full potential during the 2022-2023 season and beyond. If Dortmund's cards are played right, they will continue to be title contenders and possibly winners in the coming seasons. We're already seeing great signings and Teresic will likely kill it and lead the team to more titles, but he will no doubt be under an insurmountable amount of pressure due to the past seasons that Dortmund have had. 
Either way, I'm glad BVB listened to their fans and made the necessary personnel adjustments and leadership. <sighs> Kind of a long video, but I've been watching these two closely for quite some time. And as a Dortmund fan, I was super excited to see that BVB beat out the competition to sign both of them. So what do you guys think? Do you think these are two jackpot signings for Dortmund? Or do they essentially both suck in your opinion? <laughs> or do you think they won't fit in with the team? Or do you think Zula or Schlotterbeck should have chosen other teams to go to, right? And especially at this important time of their careers as footballers. Personally, though, I'm excited uh, and I remain optimistic. I think both of these guys are really going to shine next season. And I think that Dortmund is going to get some silverware. I won't, you know, I won't, I, I won't be too ambitious. I'll say that they'll at least maybe win one domestic trophy and <laughs> make it, you know, pretty far in the Champions League this time instead of bombing out of the Champions League and then bombing out of the Europa League <laughs> and not winning anything but, you know, second fiddle to Bayern Munich. But we'll see. And of course, you should all let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to click the like button, subscribe, hit the bell, and follow me for some more football-related content. Also, uh, follow me on Twitter. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.